Seattle Forum member Ken Martin uh, was kind enough to arrange for uh, today's featured speaker. I had the pleasure of hearing him at uh, Rotary International Convention in Montreal, and I'm sure you will be as inspired by his speech as I was. Um, uh, at this point, Ken, would you come forward? Thank you. Please join me in welcoming Robert Mazuka to Seattle Four. Thank you, Ken. What a pleasure it is to be back. This is one of my absolute favorite parts of the world. Uh, unfortunately, we landed at 10.30 and I go wheels up at 3.30 and I can't even go get a piece of fish. Um, so I'm really hurt by that. But it's great to be here. It's great to be back in, in the Northwest. Uh, I'm a Western product, born and raised in Northern California. So it's uh, good to be back on, on, in the West. It's also be great, great to be back with Rotary. Um, you know, I, I had a wonderful experience as a member of the Stockton Club and a member of the Sacramento Club. Um, it sort of went like this. And when I went to Stockton as their scout executive, a member of the selection committee, the member of one of the, bo the board of directors committee that hired me there, a member of that committee was a fellow that's known and loved in both the scouting world and the rotary world, Cliff Docterman. And he sponsored me into the Stockton Rotary Club. As a matter of fact, there is no question in Stockton, California, that the scout executive will be a Rotarian. There is absolutely no question. It was a great experience, and that got me started in my Rotary adventure. Actually, I was honored to receive just last year the Cliff Doctorman Award from Rotary, and Cliff himself presented it as I went back and visited the Sacramento Rotary Club and talked with them. It was a true honor. And the greatest thrill of my life was being the warm-up act for Dolly Parton at the Rotary International Convention in Montreal. <laughs> you know, uh, I thanked President Kenny for inviting me for two reasons. One was that it was important that we talk about scouting in our 100th anniversary. But for me, it was a personal accomplishment and an ability to check off one of the most important items on my bucket list. I have been for years hoping to be good enough one day to be the warm-up act for Dolly Parton. And it, it worked. It worked. <laughs> You know, Rotary has been a uh, long, dedicated, and valued partner with the Boy Scouts of America for a long, long time. Um, we're going to talk just a little bit today about that relationship. I'm going to talk a little bit about scouting, and I'm going to share some thoughts with you about our 100th anniversary and why I think it's so important. But as we think about the mission of Rotary and the mission of the Boy Scouts of America, I'm reminded of the words of Harvey Firestone, the founder of the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company, when he said the growth and development of people is the highest calling of leadership. And Firestone's words truly do define how we see the mission of the Boy Scouts of America, helping young Americans make the most of themselves, learn the meaning of service above self, acquiring the skills necessary to be leaders, fostering a deep and abiding sense of stewardship for their communities and for their environment, and assimilating the values that are embedded in the Scout Oath and Law. This movement, for indeed that's what it was, uh, spawned from the vision of a decorated British general, Lord, Al Lord Robert Baden-Powell, and you've all heard the stories, and his efforts to do something to positively impact recently urbanized and industrialized London. Baden-Powell's first camp out of 22 boys on Brown Sea Island in 1907 gave rise to this remarkable phenomenon today that serves millions across the world. The Boy Scouts of America began just three short years later in 1910, and you heard the story. I was going to tell you the story of uh, William Boyce and the foggy London evening and the Boy Scout who refused to take a tip. Uh, but that's true. That's the, that was the genesis of the vision for scouting. Boyce sought out Baden-Powell to find out more about this. How does that work? How do you get a little street urchin to refuse a tip? He wanted to know. He was a publisher from Chicago. He learned from Baden-Powell, came back, and the rest, as they say, is history. And the partnership between Rotary and the Boy Scouts of America goes way back, almost a century, to the beginnings of scouting in America in 1910. In fact, in 1918, Rotary was the very first service club in the United States to adopt scouting. Rotary's founder, Paul Harris, and the first chief scout executive of the Boy Scouts of America, James E. West, were the best of friends. And together they traveled the country establishing Rotary Clubs and local Boy Scout Councils. And by 1930, Rotarians had organized more than half of the then 500 Boy Scout Councils 
across the United States. And our relationship continues strong and vibrant today with Rotary Clubs in the United States sponsoring more than 1,400 scout units serving over 45,000 young people. It's not surprising to me that the relationship is long and strong. Um, we have so very much in common when you think about it. And probably the strongest link between our two organizations is the remarkable similarity between Rotary's four-way test and the Boy Scout Oath and Law. Each of those marvelous testaments to how we should strive to live our lives offers each of our members a set of words to live by. And they've served us both well and the communities that we serve over the decades. Now, I'm delighted to tell you that scouting today is strong, it's vibrant, it's on the move. Outdoor and high adventure programs continue to enjoy a record participation. I'm especially pleased to share with you that for the fifth year in a row in 2009, the Boy Scouts of America produced a record number of Eagle Scouts in any one calendar year, 52,470. 469 of them right here in the Chief Seattle Council. And if you take that over the past five years, that's over 250,000 Eagle Scouts in just the last five years. What a remarkable gift to America that is. As a matter of fact, Anthony Thomas, an Eagle Scout from Minneapolis, was named this, just this year our two millionth Eagle Scout in the history of the Boy Scouts of America. We have over 3 million members and 1.2 million adult volunteers, many of them right here in this room, in 299 local councils across the country. Chief Seattle Council has always been an iconic Boy Scout Council for the Boy Scouts of America. It's uh, world class and sets the standard for quality program delivery and changing the lives of young people here in the Northwest. You have a rich tradition, and you heard a list of some of the folks that, that Ken mentioned, but Several of these have gone on to give leadership nationally to the Boy Scouts. Chuck Piggott, who was the former president of the Boy Scouts of America. Jack Creighton, of course, served as our national president. Steve Rubel, Phil Condit, Wayne Perry, Scott Oakey, to name a few, who are all have their fingerprints all over the national organization of the Boy Scouts and bring the Seattle energy to the leadership of our program nationally. We're really in the midst of a milestone adventure, though, this 100th anniversary. We're 100 years old. I, you know what a remarkable achievement and opportunity this is. Now, think about it, and I would be able to ask Harvey because he could tell me, but I suspect that anybody or anything that reaches 100 years probably has earned the right to a little arthritis, huh? kind of a little, little slow to move and that kind of thing. Uh, well, that's probably the case, but in our case, we have become fairly stodgy and fairly bureaucratic as an organization. And one of our goals through this 100th anniversary and some other projects that we're working on is to sort of reinvent ourselves in a way that is vibrant and dynamic and relevant in its delivery mechanisms to the young people and young families of today. But we're going to take this 100th anniversary, we have taken this 100th anniversary, not as an opportunity to kind of look back and celebrate the good old days. We, could, we had a choice. We could have baked a cake on February the 8th, had a big party, stood around and sang happy birthday and talk about the good old days. Or we could use the opportunity of the 100th anniversary to do what I call an absolutely essential task, and that is to reintroduce scouting to the American people. You see, in my opinion, for far too long, for well over a decade, almost two, we've let others define us instead of defining ourselves. We've allowed ourselves to be co-opted by others for their own agenda. And as long as we're willing to do that, we, have to, we must be willing to live with the consequences. But in my opinion, it's time to take our definition back. We have such a positive story to tell. And for a century, we've made such an incredible impact. You know, I wear this lapel pin or something like it every place that I go. And it's really kind of neat. As a matter of fact, I've been offered today some, how much you want to pay for this, can you? He said, I want that pin. But it's really kind of cool. And I travel a lot. I'll spend 236 nights this year in a hotel. Because of what we're trying to accomplish, you can't do it by sending memos. You've got to, you've got to meet the people. So it goes kind of like this. I'll get on the plane this afternoon to go back to Dallas, and I'll go to take my coat off. And as I do, the seatmate invariably will say, oh, that's a Boy Scout pin, isn't it? I say, yeah, yeah, probably. I will say, yes, it is. Some version of this is usually the next thing out of his mouth. Are they still around? <laughs> Are they still around? I just told you we've got 3 million kids, 1.2 million volunteers. We've had 115 million 
matriculate through the program over our century, and of course we're still around. But that speaks volumes about our marketing, public relations, communications, and awareness level over the last decade or so, doesn't it? So I would proudly say, yes, of course we are, and I'll sit down, and now I kind of like to listen to books and hunker down and go to sleep, right? So I put on my little Bose headset and plug it into my iPod. You see, I'm technical now, Manny. I can do these things. And um, we'll go to take off, and the next thing you know, I get a tap, tap, tap on the shoulder. He said, now that you mention it, I didn't mention it, you did. Let me tell you about my scoutmaster, old Joe Cobus. You know, next to my dad, he was the most important thing in my life. He was the biggest influence in my life. I wouldn't be the man I am today if it wasn't for old Joe. So then I feel compelled to tell him about Roy Pedersen, my scoutmaster. That's really cool. So we swap some stories. I'm really tired. I put on a headset another couple hundred miles. You know, it just got me to thinking, I need to tell you about old Camp Wally Gazip. You know, there's some stories I can't tell you, but I can tell you this one. <laughs> and he begins to tell me stories about summer camp. And so I begin to tell him about Camp Pico Blanco. The greatest, glorious, most glorious days in my life. Hunker back down. Tap, tap, tap. By the way, you know the biggest regret of my life is what? Never made it to Eagle. I said, yeah, you got the fumes. Perfume, gas fumes are both, and you're straight off the reservation. And I understand that, but you got life, right? Yeah, or I was a star. That's cool. That's fine. Now, here is where I'm really proud of my Boy Scout heritage. I'm man enough not to rub it in and say, but I got mine. I don't do that. But invariably, what I'm talking about is a connection with something that was meaningful in this person's life, and he's wondering where it went. And as we dialogue on that, he's also wondering, how can I reconnect? How can I get back and put my shoulder back to the wheel? How can I help this next generation coming along? And so... That's, to me, what this whole 100th anniversary adventure is all about. Extending the invitation, inviting people back into the tent. Not to relive the glory days, although glorious they were, but to help us launch the next century of service to the youth of America. The theme, celebrating the adventure, continuing the journey, demonstrates the celebration is all about our future. It started appropriately enough, some of you may have seen it, on New Year's Day with a scout-built float and the Tournament of Roses Parade, which actually won the National Award for the best depiction of American life, past, present, and future. We uh, had the obligatory black tie event in Washington in February to coincide with the birthday. We, of course, you've heard about the iconic jamboree we had just a few weeks ago in Fort A.P. Hill in Virginia, one of the most remarkable events. If you've never experienced we become the ninth largest city in the state of Virginia overnight. And you can't imagine what 45,000 young guys can do to a piece of property like Fort A.P. Hill. It's incredible. <laughs> and then beyond these nationwide iconic events, every community across the country is celebrating. I was just last weekend at a big event in Baltimore where the, for the first time in the history of the shrine, the Park Service allowed kids to camp at Fort McHenry. And to wake up in the morning and have that flag raised on that pole above that iconic fort and to spend that entire day in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Boy Scouts and to close it off with tribute to old glory that evening was a very special, special thing. All of these things are critical, and ladies and gentlemen, I would submit to you that the need is enormous. And I don't believe there's been a time in our history when we've needed what scouting and things like scouting have to offer more than we need it today. There was a time in our society where kids were better protected than the President of the United States. You know, it's, it's kind of cliche and almost trite about it takes a village. But in fact, there was a time when the whole village had their back. That's not the case anymore. Kids are an audience for broadcasters, uh, you know, a target for marketers and retailers. They're, 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 they're celebrated for their ability to spend their parents' money, perform well on standardized tests. They become adults far too soon without ever quite growing up, absorbing words and images that they're not ready to comprehend. They're always connected, yet strangely disconnected. I will submit this, however. Our kids today have the strongest thumbs in the history of mankind. <laughs> there is one plus there, very strong thumbs, but that's not quite enough to justify the strange disconnection receiving from all of the various media and all kinds of a million messages on how to live their lives. Now, scouting can't solve all of these problems, and I'm not here to tell you that we can, and I'm not going to pretend that scouting is the panacea. 
But we can partner with parents and schools and organizations like Rotary and others to do our part to attack some of these. Because that's what we've been doing for 100 years. It's part of our DNA to produce kids that are physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. For 100 years, that's what we've done. But what about this physically strong thing? What does that mean? Well, I don't know about you, but I see ahead of us uh, some trying times. Um, Dr. Richard Carmona, when he was Surgeon General, great guy, by the way. You talk about bootstraps up from the bottom coming up to rise to the very height of his potential. Great man. But he testified before Congress a couple of years ago when he was Surgeon General about the plight of children. And he said a lot of things, many things I don't understand, way above my pay grade. But he made a statement in there that, to me, just grabbed me right by the throat, and I hope it does the same to you because it's frightening. When he said to Congress, he said, ladies and gentlemen, we're on the verge for the first time in our history of having the very first generation that's likely to be less healthy and live fewer years than their parents because of the sedentary lifestyle of children today, the onset of adult diseases in children today because of childhood obesity and other things. We are on the verge of having the first generation in the history of this country or of mankind that's likely to be less healthy and live fewer years than their parents. Now, what does that have to do with scouting? I, that's not our problem, is it? I would submit it's all of our problems, ladies and gentlemen. Think about it from a global point of view. Who's going to pay the health costs? We can't figure out how to pay what we got now. Who's going to deal with the health implications of this? How are you as entrepreneurs and businessmen here in the Northwest in this beautiful part of the world going to find a vibrant, dynamic workforce that's going to come and give you a good hard work, day's work for a day's pay and deliver the good old American work ethic so you can stay competitive with your goods and services in the global marketplace? You know, every day I travel, every day I see these glorious people, men and women in the armed forces traveling back and forth, defending the freedoms that we enjoy and appreciate so much. Where are we going to find a vibrant, dynamic, and healthy military to continue to defend those things that we appreciate so much and I hope we don't take for granted? Scouting has a huge role to play in that. We're all about no child left inside. We own the outdoors. Every council in America has property that's underutilized. Why aren't we leading the charge of getting kids off the couch and outside? You know, scouting is one of the last places left where in a relatively unstructured way you can actually climb a tree. Play steal the bacon. Do a little grabbing and wrestling and, and actually just get out and be a kid. And along the way, as you're climbing that mountain, you learn an awful lot about yourself. You learn that nobody has to lose for you to win. Everybody makes the team in scouting. As a matter of fact, you learn that it's a whole lot more fun to get to the top of the mountain with your buddies than it is to get there by yourself. So there's a huge role that scouting can play in the universe of childhood health and well-being, not just physical, but emotional and spiritual. What about this mentally awake thing, scouting second aim? Some of you may recall uh, last uh, two years ago, two summers ago, that tornado that tore through Little Sioux Scout Reservation, Scout Ranch in Iowa, killed four young men, hurt several others. Terrible, terrible, terrible tragedy, horrible tragedy. And that happened on a Wednesday, and on Thursday I was on my way to Omaha, and uh, I thought this is just going to be a life changer for me. And it truly was, but I had no idea in what direction my life was going to change as a result of that. You see, I visited all four of the families who lost children in that tragedy, and you talk about strong, faith-based, big group hug families. These were really grounded people. They were awesome and powerful. I visited every child in the hospital that was hurt. And it was amazing to me to see the kind of resiliency that they had. I remember one young man in the hospital, his name was Philip. He was 16 years old, and he had the nastiest head wound I've ever seen. He had, he just, his head was stapled together. As it turned out, as the chimney blew up in the building they were in, it was, he was hit by a piece of the chimney. And he said to me, Mr. Mazuka, you know, I knew I was I'm laying there on the ground, and you know how head wounds bleed, and I'm laying there dying. I know I'm dying. And the next thing I know, there's somebody with a bare hand staunching the blood. And that somebody with the bare hand doing that was a 15-year-old Boy Scout with a broken leg who knew that this boy was worse off than me. Just story after story after story. We got there uh, the Sunday after it was over. The council invited the families there to kind of just get some closure and to see the devastation. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And part of the group that was there were the first responders who showed up 
to respond to this tragedy. And he said, the, 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 the grizzled old veteran leader of this said to me, he said, you know, we had to cut our way through with axes and saws and trees were down. And we knew when we got there we were going to find utter chaos and turmoil. And when we got here, you know what we found? This place was perfectly triaged. Young men giving treatment to other young men based on their need. If you were just scared, you were over here with a group of older scouts that were calming you down. If you were seriously hurt, there were scouts who knew how to give first aid. The vast majority of them were young people with, with a few good adults that knew what they were doing as well. And he said the most pleasant surprise of our life was when we got here, all we had to do was step in and take over the good work that was being done. Mentally awake. One young, one reporter, the only story I'll tell about the press on this whole issue. One reporter pestering a young man about, you know what they want to know, of course, right? What do they want to know? Who messed up? Whose fault is it? It's got to be somebody's fault, right? She's talking to a boy trying to get him to say that our leaders messed up or we shouldn't have been there. And he finally looked at her, and he had this sort of doggone it lady look on his face, and he said, let me just put it this way. I'm just so thankful this happened to us and not somebody who didn't know what to do. This is a 15-year-old boy. The world saw what being mentally awake and being attentive to your duties and mindful of your chores was all about and was delivered to those young men that weekend. I got telegrams from all over the world that I delivered to them. The King of Sweden, who's a great scouter, loves scouting, sends this. It's remarkable. Condolences, but absolute congratulations. And what about this morally straight thing? You know, all you Eagle Scouts in the room, you're going to help me with this one. All you guys that were in scouting. Nothing defines a scout or a scouter. Nothing defines us better than those 12 marvelous words of the scout law. Trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. That's the iconic definition of a scout. When you ask somebody, what do you think of a scout? They'll find one or two or three of those words and put them in combination. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know a single person who wakes up in the morning and says, you know, today's Wednesday. By gosh, this is my day to be dis disloyal. <laughs> or, you know what, today I'm going to be irreverent. <laughs> or maybe it just suits me to be a coward today. Nobody sets out to be those things or to embrace those kind of what we would consider characterful. But like anything else that we do, to master it, to be good at it, to have it become part of our routine, what do you have to do? Pra it works for everything with me but golf. <laughs> practice. You have to practice. To be good at anything, you have to practice. And so on Tuesday night in the church basement, when these young men show up, like these guys will next week, They'll stand in the church basement or wherever they have their meeting and they'll raise their hand and their sign and they'll repeat the oath and the law and they'll memorize those words. And then the next weekend they're going to go out and help you with the harvest program. And they're going to learn what it really feels like to help other people at all times. By electing their patrol leader from among their peers, they know what it's like to be obedient. They also know that in a democracy to fix it, if you got it wrong, you wait till the next election. Those things happen. When they celebrate an interfaith service, church service, on a Sunday at a camporee, when they're all gathered together, certainly their faith and their God deepens, but so does their respect for others. Those things become part of their fabric and part of their essence because they practice. And that's what scouting delivers to everybody, to everybody who, who participates. In his book, Legacy of Honor, Alvin Townley tells the remarkable story of Eagle Scout George Coker, who was taken prisoner during the Vietnam War. After two months of torture at the hands of the Viet Cong, Coker could barely remember his own name, but he tells Townley in such powerful words he could remember the scout oath. As he explained to Alvin, he said, the very last thing I could consciously hold on to was the scout oath. And by the end, I could only get out those first words, on my honor. But it allowed me to hang on to my dignity and my honor and not do what they wanted me to do. He held on to his sanity, holding on to the scout oath, and survived 2,382 days as a POW before returning to America. Today, George Coker is a scouting volunteer in Virginia. And you can bet his scouts know what it means to say on my honor. Kids today need words to hold on to, words to live by. 
In a world where the only constant is change, where all values are shifting and all ethics are situational, they need a firm foundation on which to build lives of character, service, leadership, achievement, and commitment. Lives just like each and every one of you have built. So God bless you all for what you do to positively impact this marvelous part of our world. Thank you for being Rotarians. Thank you for being Scouters. And thank you for allowing me to break bread with you today. God bless you. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health. 